it could be more than machine learning. And I realize, of course, you know, this is not your grandson's machine learning in the sense that I'm the grandfather. And everyone's coming up with these newfangled things. And of course, we've been learning for a long time. And I'm not that old. And we've been uh, using machines for a long time. So I'm going to give you my take on something that is uh, raising probably more questions than there are answers, although I have some answers. And it's work that I've been doing for a variety of uh, years now, uh, primarily with Sophia Olheda, who's a statistician at University College of London. Okay. Another title I thought about was, well, um, would machine learning have discovered plate tectonics? Okay. So in everything that we do, it's not about just finding a parameter or, or, or labeling something correctly. It's about whether or not the tools that we are so busy developing actually help us do something that furthers, in my case, the geoscience, right? Um, people didn't figure out plate tectonics for a very long time until somebody did. And they were asking the right questions. They were putting the right things together. They had the right background and knowledge. Um, I don't expect you to know plate tectonics in any more detail than there are plates. Okay, this is a big deal. The Earth's outer shell is segmented, okay, in 15, 20, you call it, different plates that behave coherently, rigidly. In other words, they are stiff, and that's what makes them a plate. And then, as we've seen in the first talk, at their boundaries especially, we have earthquakes, and of course, there's things on the inside. But the fact that the Earth isn't a mush and not rock solid, but is rather a dynamic hole that is nevertheless capped by a set of segmented plates is sort of all I need you to know about plate tectonics. Okay? And it took, uh, well, mankind 8,000 years to figure that out. So um, it was sort of a revolution. Okay? Uh, I also don't expect you to know more geophysics than just that there are mountains and there are valleys, okay? So I call that topography. Topography is not just the size and the shape of those mountains. It's all relative to a gravity field because there is the, the um, fact that they are defined with reference to a uh, equipotential. So there's a physical field behind it. But you can think about them as the height and the lows of the mountains. And then there is the second observable that is very important, and that is the gravity of the Earth. So you, the Earth is not a point mass, and we know all about the rotation and the ellipsoidal flapping and all sorts of things. And what I'm showing here is that if a satellite flies at a particular equipotential height, that it would pick up differences in gravitational acceleration that would show you there's a little bit more here and a little bit less there. And if and this is color-coded here, and this, these are all very sensitive measurements, but I'm not going to bore you with the units. Blue means that with respect to that particular surface, there is more. Red means there is less. And um, one, in other words, might ask, well, these are two fields. These are two images. And, and, and what's their relation? Okay? This is a question that is, is worth solving. Those things are not independent. How do they relate? I'll give you another uh, uh, example of, um, of, of geophysics. This is the Earth's magnetic field. The Earth's rocks are not, uh, well, they are magnetizable. And they have been magnetized by the Earth's geodynamo. Um, they are continuing to be inducing fields. And again, viewed from a satellite, we will pick up anomalies of magnetization, a little bit more, a little bit less here. These are very sophisticated and very sensitive measurements. But again, here, the, the idea is that there are data, many of them. And in this particular case, I'm showing them to you over the continents and then over the oceans. And here again, I've got two fields. And imagine those have to be segmented by your algorithm. What would those relations be? What is different between the fields that are collectively over the continents and collectively over the oceans, because we know, thanks to geology and plate tectonics, that those things have almost nothing to do with each other in their formation. They ha are and they have different properties. So here, the machine learning problem might be, well, again, two fields. How will you segment them? And what is the relation between those segments? And why do we pick it? And what do we learn from it? I'll return to topography, and I put the oceans on there. I've changed the color bar a little bit. 
Now you're seeing that, of course, here is also a segmentation, just oceans, continents, um, very different features. If you want to go all the way down to the Earth itself and you pick up a rock on the ocean floor or a rock from the continent, they will not be alike in their composition, their density, their characteristics. And so you see right away that the oceans have a different uh, character. I'll bring gravity back for you. Uh, in its, in its uh, same rendition as before, but I put the continents back here. And so now the question is, well, now I've got two fields. I know they're related. I'm trying to figure out their relation, but I know the relationship is not going to be, con it's not going to be stationary over this, the area of the sphere, so I might have to segment that relation and learn from the pieces. Again, those two fields, what are their relations? Okay. Um, a training set, we have an Earth, but all the other bodies in the solar system have topographies and gravities and magnetic fields as well. So what planet is that? OK, is it a cap, a cup, or Venus? <laughs> what do you think? Well, from a cat, a cup, or Venus, what? I kind of gave it away. OK, a ball, a car, or Mars? It's Mars, OK? Here's our Earth's moon. So you see that these objects, they have characteristics. You know, they're terrestrial planets. You know, we call them terrestrial planets because they're Earth-like. But I hope you all see that they're not at all Earth-like. They're completely different features, and yet, you know, it is a little hard to figure out, and this is exactly what we are trying to do when we're doing what's called geophysics, studying what makes these planets similar, what makes them different, what makes those moons Earth-like, what makes them not Earth-like, okay? So um, what are my research objectives and what I think are the bigger uh, picture research objectives in the, in, in the geosciences as much as it applies to this here? is, well, we should be able to characterize planetary topography. I'm completely with the program. We shouldn't just measure everything everywhere. We need to abstract and synthesize, and we need to learn something from it. And that learning is going to have to be statistical. So planetary topography and gravity, for now, those two, can we characterize them as a statistical uh, process, and what form and shape would that take? Uh, if you're asking that independently, but I'm stressing their relation, you need to be asking that jointly, okay? So this is no more about a set of images. This is about a set of images and their relations. And of course, those are physical fields and they relate in a physical way. There is a physics behind it. So the joint statistical structure of gravity and topography is for the next 25 minutes on my, uh, on my agenda. And that's not necessarily just uh, 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 that easy. Things may be uh, individually isotropic, but jointly anisotropic, for instance, or even vice versa. And if we have some sort of a way of describing these things statistically, can we just find what their parameters are, what controls them, and then can we find them if we have picked a certain model and then we feed it a Venus or we feed it a moon? And if we can find them, can we find how good they are? And if we find the best ones, can we find that they are really good enough? Finding the best fitting parameters is nowhere near as interesting as finding that those best fitting parameters are actually fairly good at describing what's going on. In other words, that the model is adequate. Uh, lastly, and I'll uh, talk least about this, is do any of these parameters that we then extract from it mean anything physically? Okay, So that will then be properly the, 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 the source of geophysics, and I'm not going to tell you about it. But if we classify a certain landscape or a certain planet as a certain uh, statistical process with a certain parameter, that we can find and be happy with that is well found and applies, then we need to know what it means, okay, and how it evolves and how things uh, um, control it. And then finally, you know, since we are here trying to train models with, with uh, whether it's seismology or magnetism or any other things, we really would like to solve, say, wave propagation problems in the global Earth and then say, well, now let me perturb it, as Monica was, was having earlier. How do you then describe that state about which to perturb? We would like to generate random planets and have them be Venus-like, for instance. And that would be different than generating random planets that would be Earth-like or random moons that would be moon-like. 
Okay, so back to topography. Back to that free air gravity anomaly. This is the only jargon that you'll get. This is imagine the satellite, and the satellite is at an equipotential surface. Now, being a geologist, you would then also know, well, at least some of those anomalies of gravitational attraction must be come from the fact that there are mountains to begin with. So if you go and walk on the surface of the Earth and you measure the height of those mountains, essentially with a ruler, you should be able to take those rocks, measure their density, and subtract the known effect of the known mounts of the mountain, uh, uh, their known effect on the gravity. So let's remove that gravity from the known surface topography, that which you and I know and can see, the height of the mountains. And that then results in the Bouguet gravity anomaly. That's the second piece of jargon here. So that's essentially just what a satellite would see, minus what the known effects of the mountains in our face are in their density to gravity effect. And if I look now at the relationship be between gravity and topography that you see that, well, I, at least my eye wants to see that it, it is much uh, cleaner. It, it looks like there is a much more easy to describe relation than if we looked at this rather complex view. Again, the details are really the domain of geophysics, but the point I'm trying to make here is that when we make something that is a big correction, that is a, a massively physically based perturbation to what we're measuring, we're bringing our data in a domain where we have a lot less explaining to do because we're no longer seeing the superposition of multiple different processes, one of which we understand perfectly well, which is the effect of a rock that has mass, that has density, that maps into the Earth's gravitational field. The things that we can see, we should subtract them out of there. And that's why people, and I, I here will focus on this particular rendition of the gravity anomaly. And another way to talk about this particular gravity anomaly is that it will tell you something about the subsurface, okay? That is really also an element of geology that is important here, is that it's not about what we see at the surface, it's about what we see at the subsurface. That's why we do seismology, that's why we do gravity, that's why we do all sorts of things. Okay, so I'm gonna try to uh, have you have this diagram in mind here and I'll walk you through it on the board and I'll leave it on that board there. And um, what it is meant to illustrate is the following. So imagine there is a plate, okay? So now a plate is just something that's relatively stiff and it is there to begin with. And then a mountain forms on it. So this is a hypothetical, unrealizable situation where this, this, this is the time before zero situation where mountains form. But this particular plate has a strength, like every beam in your house and like every um, physical structure. And so, depending on its elastic strength mechanically, that loading uh, piece of uh, topography here is gonna weigh it down. It's gonna s somehow create a root or compensate it or deflect that beam. So what you might learn this in, in engineering 101. So H1 is some sort of a hypothetical driving uh, process, and it results in, a, in, a, in an effect that I'll call H11 and H12. So H11 is the result on interface one of process one, and H212 is the result on interface two of process one. Similarly, in the subsurface, there may be another process acting on it, and so at that second boundary, I may perturb it, and I'll call it some process one, and it too, it works it, it on the same elastic plate, so it will just sort of pull the top down and, and, and create its own compensating interface, and that will give me H22 and H21. So the first index is where the process is being caused, and the second index is where it is being received. And so, of course, it generalizes to Hij. So 2,2 two is the effect of process 2 loading with this initial thing here, and that's the result. But, of course, it also has a result at the top. And it's not a mirror. It's not the same. It's not the negative. It's, 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 it's a mapping, okay? Neither... This, of course, is physically, you know, never the case because that's, that's the abstraction. This is physically what happens, and this is physically what happens, but neither of those things we can observe. We only observe the sum, which is when we're done um, with this process, and we can only observe the sum of H11 and H22, 
which I'll call H summed out 0, or rather an O1. And that is summed out 0 on 2. So H O1 is the height of the mountains as you and I know when we climb them. H O2 is the sum of th those two interface processes, which we cannot get to except with seismology or with gravity. And so in, 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 uh, indeed, the only way to measure the subsurface topography here, this HO2 process, is through its attraction on a, a, a passing satellite or a gravimeter or, or some other way of measuring its gravity. And I'm mapping that here as this blue curve here. So we cannot drill holes that deep. We can send seismic waves and get that sort of inference also. But I'm bringing it back to the first few slides here. H01 is the topography that you see when you walk in the field. The blue line is the gravitational attraction that is predicted by that perturbation in the subsurface, which is its own form of topography, but we can only indirectly observe it. And so that would be, I'll be calling that G02. Okay, so I haven't told you anything yet about uh, the words at the top, isostasy and flexor, but isostasy and flexor are telling us, and I'll give it one parameter here called D, how that elastic plate behaves, what the properties of that, that plate, plate are. And now I'm going to uh, uh, set up your, your uh, inverse problem for you, which right away we have to start considering, is we're observing the sum of a process of two processes that are caused by two different things at two different levels, but mapped by the same type of physical principle. But here's a random field, and here's another random field. Something deterministic maps it onto a, a, a result on two interfaces whose sum we observe. So a 2D, a two-dimensional bivariate random field that we know is in a known relation, but that we're only observing indirectly through the sum of outputs driven by unknown inputs. That's the inverse problem. And yet, somehow, it seems easy because all I really want is one parameter. So I want to kind of find one number, and I'll be having thousands and thousands of data points. And so your initial reaction might be, well, how hard could it be? Okay. The answer is, you know, well, it's in the summed of results of unknown inputs with a random field in behind that does make it hard. So I'll just give you one physics equation, actually two, but they're very similar. This is how, basically, you got to know how uh, a beam works, okay? This is a classic beam equation. This is a biharmonic equation. G is the acceleration due to gravity, considering no perturbations at all. It's basically how fast the apple accelerates. Delta 2 is the density jump from one layer to the next. D is my mystical parameter, which is an elastic constant that tells me how easy it is to buckle, deflect, and deform a plate. So there's a balance. And similarly, that second process, H2, is being balanced by this is a sine switch on the, and a left and a right switch. And so again, the biharmonic flexural equation. So in the case of an ice cube in your glass of water, which I recommend you all drink, um, the D would be non-existent, that term would be non-existent, and you pl your water has no strength effectively, and you'd have the iceberg principle, and that's what's called airy isostasy, if you care. Anything else where plates have finite strength uh, perturbs you from that situation, and then you have something that's called flexor. Okay, so my objective here as a, as a geoscientist is to find D from observations of gravity and topography, which I claim I can make with infinite precision which is true on the scale of things because we measure the height of mountains and the acceleration due to gravity with very, very fine precision and accuracy. Now there's a math equation that tells you how this mapping goes from the subsurface perturbation onto the gravity, and I'm doing that most easily in the spectral domain. And so essentially every little contribution of a density change um, has a little extra gravity. And the gravity observed at the height of the satellite is going to be uh, easily, relatively speaking, mapped by these delta terms, which are the density jumps. And every one of them has 
an effect on the acceleration. And I'm uh, taking some liberty here, but then, then I use an exponential decay term with height to show you that, well, at the height of the satellite or at the height above the causing uh, density structure, that effect will be felt very uh, differently. Okay? That's another fact of physics uh, 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 for you that obviously the farther you are away from the causing masses that you're going to feel that force attenuating. Please. It, it does. So in this case, I, I, was, I was trying to al already tell you that. So here there's a density and another density. So there is one density jump delta 1 and one delta j density to jump delta 2. And at this level of the equation, there is only one gravitational acceleration for this whole system, and that's called g. But you're absolutely right that it, it's not circular or it's not wrong, but, but it's, it's about the relative size of the term. The satellite, of course, is measuring the gravitational acceleration differences as an anomaly caused by these very things, which you know are causing internally uh, uh, changes in delta G. However, that effect doesn't map through the same way. It's an approximation, but it works very, very well. It is, if you took the G into account as dependent on the topography as you really should, you would do it, but to this level it wouldn't matter because we're dealing with ultimately things that, that uh, are in the right scale for that not to matter. But that's a very good point. It's the sort of, uh, um, this is an, uh, is an, is an um, there's no finite amplitude to this particular problem, but people have done, know how to do it, do it in some cases, but I'm not doing that right here because it doesn't matter at this scale. Yeah, but it get, would get even more interesting then. Yeah, people do do it. Okay, so there is topography, there's gravity, and so if I'm just saying what we can observe, well, it's the sum of these four effects because every one of them has a little perturbation of a little, you know, more density or less density there, a little bit more mountain here, less mountain there. And if I tell you that I can subtract the known effect of the masses of the mountains, well, then I'm looking at the subsurface, and that amounts to me not taking the 1, 1 um, and 2, 1 terms and just being left with that Bouguer anomaly. So back to the problem. I have this <laughs> blue thing, which I now call G, G prime. Okay, that's that gravity anomaly which has already um, taken out the visible topography. And I have my actual topography which I measure with a ruler. And the question is can I find D, the thing that mapped things from one to the other. And I'm going to consider them stochastic process and, and I'll just jump back to 40 years ago when people said, well, if all of this modeling is true, then you can figure out their relation by hand because consider them uh, to be ultimately stochastic process, which means they're amenable to ensemble averaging using these brackets here. Then I can do an old engineering admittance, and I will, uh, the ratio of the cross power spectral density of these things normalized by the power spectral density of that is defined to be the admittance. And if I have data, I can try to estimate it. A similar but related measure is the square of the cross power density of those two processes normalized by the individual power spectral densities is the coherent square. And that too is something that one routinely calculates because it's another measure of relation between the fields. So gravity and topography are related. These are two uh, common measures of relation. These are the theoretical quantities, and we would need to estimate them. And I'll tell you a little bit about how that works. So now, in geophysics, people have been doing this sort of thing for ages, and they have said, well, if that's defined to be the admittance, and everything that I've said on the board is the gospel truth, then you know what this admittance should be as a function of wavelength for a particular value of d. You'd be on some curve. And if you focus on Process two, the top loading, uh, process one would be the top loading. This is what it would be. If you focus on the bottom loading, it would be uh, on that. And if there's a mixture, there'd be different curves to be on. So this is the sort of engineering approach where if everything works, combined with the statistical approach of can we estimate it, then that is the average behavior of the relation between gravity topography as a function of wavelength. 
Now, uh, I'm already here in the more complicated domain where it's not either this or that, but it's the sum of those, then both play. And I'll just do for you now that I break those cross power spectral densities uh, apart in terms. Now, the first process, its power spectral density is this second and third. And uh, if we define the cross power spectral density matrix of these two fields, the diagonals are the individuals, the off diagonals are the cross relations, then they would come out of the, as this here. And what you're seeing here is that right here, I write a relation where there's a power spectrum, another one, and another one. It's as a function of two-dimensional wave number k. And there is a delta function k, k prime here, which considers this thing to be um, a stationary field for the size and shape of the region that I'm looking at. Okay, so there's an assumption of stationarity here that uh, later on we might relax. And importantly, we will have to consider when it doesn't hold. And I just make a few assumptions to make it tractable. Now I'm, I'm, uh, I could say, well, I'm going to set this third term to zero for now. I don't have to, but I'll do it for the moment. I might then say, well, S11 and S22 would be proportional, which would clearly be helping make the problem tractable if I stipulate that there is a, a, a fixed relation between them. And so I call that parameter F2. And with these two assumptions, I might just reduce this problem of finding D in this uh, situation to finding that plus one extra parameter that couples those two things together. Um, none of this matters except for the point that if you make these assumptions and you work through this, and there really is nothing more than what is on the slides here, then you can work out what the admittance and the coherence should be on a piece of paper. And there's a variety of symbols, and you can have an equation that tells you exactly what's going on. So those are those things. Um, in there, that relation between the processes, I kept that to be depending on wave number. But if I'm sticking with, with more standard theory, we could, we could make that a constant. Again, this is an assumption we can stick in to make it visual here, but that we can relax later. So this is sort of the idea of, well, make a model and think it through to the end. And then think what sort of measurement you make. And then predict what that measurement should be. And then work backwards towards uh, what the parameters of the system are. Here's an example of what those curves look like, this ugly equation here. Well, you know, it leads to a known behavior for as a function of load loading ratio and as a function of that D, you're going to get some behavior where at very, very long wavelengths, you get a complete coherence between the mountains that you see and the gravity anomalies they create, which is logical. This is sort of large scale iceberg principle. At the very, very short wavelength, you get zero coherence between the mountains that you climb and the gravity that they measure because it's like the equivalent of putting a, a little uh, you know, slight mass on a table that doesn't really deform. There's no coherence between what, what, uh, what um, there's no transmission there. And in the intermediate range, there is a, a, a known uh, analytical behavior. OK, so um, why do we need progress is, is that when you're actually trying to do that, the way this seems convenient on a piece of paper, it gets to be very hard because you're dealing with things in the spectral domain. You have to look at finite uh, topography, uh, finite uh, gridding, finite size, finite sample size effects. So I'll just give you an example here of this thing here in the um, um, Columbia River plateau. And so here is that field one. And here's that field two, and we're looking for that relation that produced this, this sort of uh, behavior that gives us these two things. Here is that coherence. Indeed, the black line shows you the average isotropically. So that prediction that the coherence should behave as the curve I just showed you, well, in this case, it clearly does sort of look like that very coherent at the low um, wave number at the high, long wavelengths, and uh, incoherent at the short wavelengths. And then you could think of a parameter fitting approach that will give you the value of D. We look at anisotropy. We'll look at the, the, the details of it, but I won't bore you with it. But it's all pretty messy because it's actually reducing these thousands of data points. Here, there might be 2,000 data points and another 2,000 data points. By reduction, I'm reducing this to 
a non-parametric estimator of something that essentially only has about six or seven points that I work with to constrain my one or two parameters. So in terms of data efficiency, it's not that great. I might have 2,000 data points. I only do want two parameters, but I'm kind of giving up all my degrees of freedom in collapsing this onto this, this predicted curve that I can really only measure at a few, at a handful of points. So from, say, 2,000 to six to get two parameters, you're seeing there's a loss of efficiency there. The thing that I won't bore you with, with is, except by showing you, is that you really have to be careful with and field effect. Here's an example of how you might taper the window uh, around it such that you the rectangular window effect. You might, in fact, do something that's geographically selective. So you, once you let a prior or a, geo a, a geological prior decide where to look, you very precise in about uh, what are called um, or attenuating, tapering windows to actually really subselect a region of interest and do the same sort of analysis. Okay, so uh, first message is here if you do care to make a model, you actually get a long way, but then you might hit a problem of finding the parameters of the model so, such that you don't reevaluate the model, but you reevaluate how you find the parameters. Okay, so. I may have made it seem easy. If I did, I also need to pull back and say, well, this whole process, which people have been trying for a long time, ultimately results in, in estimating parameters via methods that it doesn't work that well. Okay? There's been a lot of debate on what these values of D and F are, and it remains hard. So what we need is a robust estimator for two parameters out of 2,000 data points using maybe more proper statistical theory. So, all right, let's go a little bit more into the, the learning uh, aspect of it. You know, neither of these topographies here, you know, this one and that one, in space they're not going to be typically Gaussian. But in the spectral domain they typically are Gaussian because, you know, the Fourier transform does sum a number of variables, so standard uh, central limit theorems apply. And so what I'm going to summarize these two fields as, as in a vector that contains the spectral domain version of the topography one and the spectral domain version of topography two. And I'm going to, uh, it's a little bit of a surprise perhaps that it works, you have to prove that it works, but we do model then this as a vector valued complex proper Gaussian variable system, which has a probability density distribution that is, you know, slightly changed from the well, I'll show you. It's, it's in the imaginary in the real part. And S is that big variance where I already told you that the diagonal elements or the power spectral densities of the gravity and the topography or the top and the bottom topography. And the off diagonals are the cross power spectral densities, which in my earlier example I said, let's just forget about them. But now I bring them back. So. If I bring that back, I can write it back down through the, through the, I could go through the motions and I can write what the form is of this, this, this variance operator that is a wave number dependent variance which contains the physics in these form of the equations. And of course it contains the statistics because it's the average behavior, it's a variance. And um, it contains that model. It, it's not pretty, it's not linear, but it, it, you can write it down, which is a, is, a, is a good thing. Okay? And then you can form a log likelihood of observing the data vector under there being given by this model with a particular loading process, and then uh, write a Gaussian likelihood because you're dealing with Gaussian variables. So this is another step on saying, well, we're willing to make a model, we're willing to apply the physics, we're willing to make the statistical approximation, and we're then willing to write an actual likelihood, which then using any of a variety of methods we can optimize, maximize, and solve. And so it's all vector valued, it's all spectral domain, and there's still that independence of the wave numbers that you see here, and this being given by a simple product. Um, but it's, again, something that you can write and something that you can do. And then if all of these things are uh, according to what the modeling step says, then everything else basically is, is, is hard hand work, but it, uh, handy work perhaps, but it, is, it all follows. If you have Gaussian estimators, then 
you're getting unbiased parameter estimation, you're getting maximum likely it's going to be the minimum variance, and so on. Um, but what I haven't told you is what form or shape I should give this, this power spectral density. I could factor out one thing that told me something about what these processes were like, but I haven't told you what it was. So here, we're picking one. And this is, some, this is a problem that also affects a, a lot of the machine learning communities. You've got to pick some sort of a form of your convolutional kernel, some sort of a spectral density, some sort of a curve that maps an input into an output. And here, I'm, I'm talking about a, a matern form, which is a, a thing that also uh, does arise in machine learning. And um, this particular form is a very flexible form of a power spectral density that has three parameters under isotropy. So if you're willing to say that, that your data or your process is having a variance, and if you're willing to say that that variance depends on wave number, as in it has a power spectral density, then you should be able to give it some sort of a location, some sort of a spread, some sort of a decay rate, and those are exactly the parameters that are in here. Sigma squared is the total variance in the process. Nu is the mean squared differentiability of the process, and rho is the range over which correlations die out. I'll show you some examples. Now, so that's a particular form. You can stick it in through everything that I've shown you, and then you write down what the estimator is, and then all you have to do is compute it. I'll just go quickly through the cases that work and then show you what we're doing when it doesn't work and when it gets uh, interesting again. Is that, well, Gaussian estimators, you run a 1,000 simulations. On some grid with those parameters, you should be getting Gaussian histograms back, okay? And so if you're doing it right, then D, F, sigma, rho, nu, you get all those parameters back and everything works like a charm because it's supposed to be because we started by writing it down uh, by hand. Okay, so um, I'm going to then also say, well, any of these assumptions, everything is open to challenge because if I do the model exactly as advertised, I get beautiful behavior, but all assumptions are on the table. Isotropy, non-elasticity, finite topography, uh, load proportionality, the constant of that loading ratio, everything I've said is open to, to, to not being true. And here's the last piece that makes it really science, okay? That is, if you're going through having data, making a model, writing down what it should do, predict what the observation shall be, have a method that will find the parameters, you then need to evaluate what you're doing when you're done, and when you're completely done, the residuals here, this is the topography again, this is the inverse of the variance, and this is the parameter vector at the <coughs> estimate. If everything is done right, then you have produced a chi-square variable with this many degrees of freedom in this two-dimensional case, and then you should be testing it. You may very well find the best fitting d, f, sigma, nu, rho, but if your residuals show any structure, as in deviations from this, your model isn't right, and we have to be willing to go there. Correlations, again, we built that in there. So testing the model I I is an even better idea than making a model because you could have the wrong model and you need to reevaluate. So this simple problem of having the sum of outputs of a process that is a deterministic differential equation mapping to an input to an output, but it has an unknown random field driving term, is the two-variate two-dimensional case of something that I really might just be interested in reducing that to how about just one field, just magnetism, or just a picture of something, or just something um, that is basically, let me cut the second variable. I'm done with this particular project. I'm making it simpler now. Now I'm just going to say, all right, uh, uh, Venus, Earth, Moon, uh, uh, Mars, what sort of power spectral densities, what sort of matern forms would they be, what sort of parameters would they are, can I find them, are they good enough, and what do they mean? Because if I can do that, I can actually get to that objective also of simulating things that look like Mars and that yet nevertheless aren't Mars but have all the characteristics of it. So I'll just give you a, a, a couple of slides on, on the, the viewpoint that we take here. Stationarity, okay, this means that where we're looking is where the laws apply. 
you look somewhere else, they may be different. We will find them, but we're not trying to solve this, this uh, segmentation problem right here. But we're using something known to man as geology to look where to look. Okay, So looking in the ocean and looking under the continents, it's going to be different. Why? Because you're in the ocean versus the continent. And Africa isn't the same as the Colorado Plateau or isn't the same as uh, Italy. So we allow another science to give us a prior that tells us where to look that we might accept stationarity. And so we model topography as something that has variance and something that if you re 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 uh, recognize it, you may recognize this as something that says, well, the real root of the modeling tool is that there exists an increment of variance at a certain wave number that the space-based field is just the, the Fourier transform of, if you will. The random variable is, this, is the variance increment here, dH of k. The power spectral density, and again, this is, this is nothing to do yet with how you calculate it, but that is the variance of those spectral increments. And under stationary, that's going to have this power spectral density, which is a density and therefore gets these uh, dk, dk primes in here to get to an actual variance in the end. And the delta here is the lack of coupling between the wave numbers, which assures stationarity. Because if that's the case, then the spatial covariance of this field that I might have with its complex conjugate is going to be given by this combination of these equations, which would give me some uh, uh, co-relation uh, that is depending on separation only, which is definition of stationarity. So what's on the board is the definition of stationarity. And then the spatial variance, which you, uh, is the overall energy, if you will, in the process, is, is how at one point this correlation with a distance zero is this constant called the overall variance, which in the spectral sense is distributed over different wavelengths but ultimately, there's the sigma again. Um, isotropy, well, you see the switch. The bold K becomes the thin K. Bold K becomes the thin K. And the separation becomes the distance. And everything else is unchanged. So here's the thing that, that, that uh, is very important and that maybe this is the only time you'll hear it at this meeting is that you can write all these things down in beautiful Fourier transforms and integrals and so on until you calculate them. And if you calculate them, you realize that none of it applies unless you explicitly take into account what happens when you grid your data and when you sample your data. The size, the shape, the sampling, the spacing, all of that matters. So it's not important what we think the process is like. It's important what we can learn from the data under that model. And so if we now have data, and this is subtle, until now my H was math cal, now my, ma my H is just italics. This is actual data you might get. Then you're on an actual grid, no more integrals, just sums. And you've got some weight function, maybe some nice window, and you've got, you're sampling this process, which again is in the math cal. And then you have the discrete Fourier transform of some window data set. In other words, something that you program into your computer. If it's given by this model, then you get this result, which says that the covariance of what you get in the data on the left is not at all what the theory says of being you know, beautiful S here, which is what the theory had to begin with. But it's completely corrupted by these windows, the sampling, the grid, and the size, and the shape of what you actually do in the computer. If you were to ignore this, any estimation based on it would be completely biased. It's very easy to show how it would, would be completely wrong. And so what we are going to do here, and this is an uh, important message here, is that we are going to take into account this blurring effect of discretization of data and sampling. However, you see the, there's more wave numbers than we really bargained for. I'm going to ignore the correlation. And again, that is something that's open. But no matter how beautiful your theory is, when you have the finite sample data, you never get what you want. But if you have beautiful theory, you can predict exactly what you'll get when you do what you do. And you owe it to yourself to, to do this in your simulations. 
And uh, with a slight shortcut of the correlation here is where it's just saying, well, if the data follows this model and we sample it this way, then that's what we should expect. Uh, for those of you interested, if you want to use the Matern uh, class, it's basically an equation that tells you what the decay rate are and, and, and it has its consequences. The parameters, again, are the overall variance, the mean square differentiability, and the range of correlations. The spatial variance is the integral under the power spectral density, the total mass of it. And uh, the power spectral density at zero is the combination of sigma and rho in this, in this form. So basically, you could, you could uh, um, walk your way through these equations. Here they are in picture form. So the power spectral density could be is this, as an example. The space-based correlation function is in blue. A realization of the random field is here. The circle is the size, essentially, of rho that tells you the distance, which is about that, which one-third of the um, uh, correlations decay. And here's the subtlety. Your eye might not pick it out, but in certain change parameters, you see a, a, um, oh, it's actually not my best example. But so you run, I ran them randomly. If you run them randomly, you see that all these parameters matter. And it very, it's very hard to see, on, certainly on a log space, what the differences are, but they will generate completely different looking random fields. So I'm going to cut straight to, well, now we might want to know that under this model, which is very general and very flexible, and I'll tell you more if you want to know about it, that we, we really should know everything there is to know about how we then sample, estimate, look at it and evaluate whether it's any good. Again, there is a Gaussian field at the basis. The blurring will blur the likelihood. This is how the, the observation will factor into what likelihood you actually optimize. The blurring here is that bar that is the deviation from the infinite continuous theory that brings it down to the finite sampled grid, which any computational method should do. Failure to do so, again, is just, it, we have to do it because it doesn't otherwise work. You see it right away. And then the maximum likelihood estimate is going to be the, the theta hat that you plug in here that uh, minimizes the derivative of this likelihood. And we're still with this uh, system in the sense that under this framework, we can al analytically calculate the Hessian. And we can analytically evaluate it. We could use it in the likelihood solver. We could compare all sorts of things. There's a lot of things that we can do analytically, including building all these tests. How much time do I have? OK, so I'm going to skip over what happens if you don't do it this way, which is you won't get the right result. To uh, skip over the fact that how you should do the testing, to get to the final uh, uh, set here is, let's look at Venus, OK? Patch on Venus. This gray line is what we estimate the parameterized matern spectral covariance to be. And if you really look closely, then the black dots are really only where we have scale data, OK? Because there's only so much of it. And so you're really estimating a curve in three parameters, and you have these, these few points really that control it. This is the space-based correlation function. And again, the blue line demarcates is sort of the size of the region that you have available to you. Which also, again, shows you that if you did it any other way, it would be really hard to do, because it's very hard to estimate a correlation function with uh, interesting zero limiting and decay behavior when you, when you have not enough you know, finite sample uh, uh, gridded data. Here's one example. Here's another example. So a different region, get a different function. And, now, and then we look at how, how, what is that correlation length, what is the spectral decay, what is the differentiability. And so we try to learn something geologically relevant, something geophysically relevant. But so I told you that ultimately you then also have to want to be able to simulate data. And the, 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 the method that works will be fooling a geologist into thinking, oh, that's a good-looking Venus. Okay. So here's my test to you. Left or right, which one's real, which one's simulated? Are they both real or are they both simulated? Uh, it, it's very hard to take the test here 
but you, if you open your eyes and you think about it, you can. Um, so who says that uh, uh, left is uh, real and not right? OK. Um, who says both are real? It's not a real test. Who says both are made up? OK. Right, so go through the process, right? So, you, so and the left one is real. Okay? The right one is made up, but it's made up with the parameters from the real. And you train your eye, you're going to start seeing it. How about this? Which one's real, which one's not real? Remember, these are all isotropic random fields. Okay? Even though you see lines and things, these are just random fluctuations from completely isotropic random fields. Left is real versus who thinks left is real and not right? Who thinks the right is real and not left? Who thinks they're both made up? Who thinks they're both real? So, well, we have three out of four opinions. It's a little bit all over the place. Okay, so the right one is real. The left one is made up. Uh, if you're a planetary geologist, you'll start seeing satellite tracks and things like that. But so you can sort of pick these things out. I show this picture because, you know, this line of things that people would jump to interpret are actually just random fluctuations, again, from a completely isotropic random field. I'll do this one for you. Here's another one where I showed it to planetary geologists. And they're like, yeah, yeah, that got to be real because there's a, a crater. It's a ring structure. Okay, well, this one's completely random. It's completely isotropic, and yet it generates something that to, uh, you know, some eyes would, would look like a, a, a crater. In this case, they're both made up. Uh, in this case, the left one, again, is real. The right one is made up. And you see the real one here because it's got that characteristic little thing here that, well, I just showed you one that could be made up. But the planetary geologist recognizes that as, as a real crater. And, and uh, sometimes people know exactly which crater that is. Okay. But so that is sort of the, the end of things here is that, you know, I started with with a physical model for the relation between two random fields and how we go about doing it and the, the uh, methods for it. Ending with, you know, we're really getting to a method that is characterizing two-dimensional random fields and that goes into so much of the machine learning, so much of the kernel density estimation, so much of the uh, you name it methods that by itself that is important and it's important to do well and we might learn something from it. Isotropy, it's just three parameters. Get them right, you learn a lot. Finite fields effect, they may not matter to you in computer science, but if you don't consider them, you're just off the charts. Your variance is half of what it should be. Your correlations are twice the size. You know, everything is completely off from the true value, which is called bias, and you don't want that. And then there is variance, and you don't want that either. You want the best of both worlds. We have simulation procedure to do synthetics. We have an inversion procedure that uses maximum likelihood to find the parameters. We've got all sorts of tests for thinking everything to the end that when it shouldn't work, you should see it and when to call it when it doesn't work. And Venus is our first example. We're mapping various planets. And then at the very end of the day, we'll have parameters that we then should be trying to see what they mean physically. That is also not something that I guess you have much of in the proper machine learning community where so what? Your neural network works, but give me the parameters of it. Like, what makes a cat a cat? Is this cat diseased? Is it grumpy? If that parameter of its catness tells you something about the condition of the cat, well, then you'd be doing science. And that's what we need to do in science when it's science. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs>